as we continue through our meditation through the book of Revelations. We can't miss why the book was written. It was written not to predict the future, even though it does that. It's not meant to be used as a book of trivia, but many people use it for that. It is meant to be a book of hope. And when John wrote the letter, he was isolated from the church. In many ways, his church. He was the leader of the church because he was the only surviving apostle. But he had been thrown out of the country, out of the empire. And so he's sitting there on this island, and this revelation comes. And Jesus appears to him. Jesus has this magnificent appearance. And he says, first, tell the churches what I have to say. And the first thing he does is he instructs his churches. And after that, John is pulled into the throne room of God. And throughout this book, we see God's revelation being revealed through the Son opening up what the God, what the Father had delivered him. And so last week we saw Revelations 19, the rider on the white horse. And now we're in Revelation 20. And let's see what's going on here. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was a devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until a thousand years were sealed. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. The fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and so forth, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That is Revelation 20. Revelation 20. And let's just think about this passage and let's just focus on some broad truths before we get too specific. And the first thing that we have to understand is that judgment is inevitable. Think about Psalm 119. Psalm 119, every single verse is about the word of God. And one of the words they use to summarize the word of God is judgments. Now, I notice they do not summarize it by saying encouragements. And that's why if you want to describe the Bible, you will be better off describing it as judgments than encouragements because this is a book of judgment. Right? That is not to say it's not a book of hope as well. But if you look through all the verses and you count them up, 
If you lifted all the mentions of hell and you counted them up, and you tallied them up against the mentions of heaven, you would find that it will be overwhelmingly on the side of judgment. And this is why people who turn the Bible preaching and turn church into a motivational speaking ring are so evil. They're not just mistaken, they're evil. And the reason I say they're evil is you can't study this long enough to not do this on purpose. If you are doing this full time, you know. Now listen, if you're somebody who just dabbles in the word of God and you read it here and there, you know a few verses, you could honestly be mistaken. And I can give you grace for that, and I can try to teach you a better way. But for somebody who studies this, and this is their 50 hour a week job, this is what they go home with. This is what they chew on. This is how they make their money. For them, there's no excuse. They have to be twisting the word of God on purpose. Because you cannot look at this book and not see the judgments. You cannot look at the book of Revelation and not see judgment. So when you look at it, the first thing we have to realize is that judgment is first. Judgment is foremost. And until we understand the wrath to come, we cannot understand the mercy of God. In fact, mercy doesn't make sense unless you have mercy from something. How can you start there? Right? That is backwards. That'd be like talking about fire safety without talking about the dangers of fire. Just, hey, everybody, let's just talk about the exits to the room. And then we go there. Why do we need to go to the exit? Let's not talk about that. We're just going to be positive. We're going to smile. we all just going to go to the exit. That's what a lot of church is. The other thing we're going to notice is that everybody is going to be judged for their deeds. Everyone will be judged for their specific deeds. And nobody escapes. Not Satan. Not kings, not slaves. It doesn't matter how high or low your status might be. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a spiritual being. Everybody will face the judgment of God. Third thing that we notice is these ideas of thrones. How many times is thrones mentioned in this chapter? The idea of the authority of God. And you've got to realize, because maybe we miss it a little bit being in America. Maybe we are threatened by the authority of God, but maybe if you lived in China, you would understand it better, where you might say, I wish for the authority of God. I wish the people who were oppressing me would face a God who would hold them accountable. Right? But you have to have a strong system of justice to see that. You have to be able to see evil clearly. In our society, we're pushing more and more towards great. But when you have a clear sense of right and wrong, you can see we need a God of justice. And I'm encouraged by a God of justice. Now the details. Some people argue over this chapter. In fact, this is one of the most argued over chapters in the whole Bible. And the reason is, is that if you try to create a system of how the last days are going to work, this chapter is going to make or break. Some people don't believe in a literal millennium. And so they take these verses and they kind of twist them up a little bit. To me, they twist them. Um, but they might say they have an argument. And those are good brothers who believe it, right? We know some of them. Some of them are pastors of churches that we associate with. I don't really buy into that because I see these time markers that are listed here. And I'll just show where the time markers are. I don't think that 1,000 years necessarily has to be a literal 1,000 years, but it does have to be a long period of time. Numbers are symbols in Revelations, right? But it says he sees the thrones. Then we already know that the beast and the false prophet were thrown in hell. The devil is locked up. After a 1,000 years, the devil is set free. After that, he's thrown into the lake of fire. And it keeps time. And let us know this is not symbolic when it says where the beast and false prophet were, right? You keep getting this idea that time is passing and it's passing in a straight line in this passage. It's not jumping all around. It's not being symbolic here and <coughs> literal here. It's not switching back and forth. It's straightforward. 
Now, some people will say, well, we really don't really get much mention of this millennial kingdom anywhere else in the scripture. I would encourage you, if you think that, to read through Isaiah 24 and 27. And tell me if you don't see a strong parallel between those. And I'll just point out one in Isaiah 24. In Isaiah 24, it is talking about a judgment on the whole world. And I want to point out this verse that I don't see a lot of people mention when we talk about last day studies. And it says this, in verse 21, On that day the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison, and after many days they will be punished. What does that describe to you? Now, some people have always made this argument. Why would God lock Satan up and then let him be free after a while? That doesn't make sense. I'm not sure why God is going to do that. But other scriptures do back that up. So some people who act like it's only in one place, they're kind of being a little bit narrow-minded when they say that. I, my personal argument is this. That God is showing us in this day and age that there is a spiritual warfare. But in the age to come, he's going to expose that man is evil just by themselves. And they don't necessarily need to be tempted by some spiritual force to do wrong. That rebellion is in our hearts. And unless God changes it, we don't need a Satan to rally around. We'll rebel on our own. But that's just my current theory. But that is Revelation 20. It's a powerful chapter. And then it gets into 21. We see the new city. Any questions or anything before I turn over to him? <clears throat> All right. So when you meditate on this chapter, I want you to be thinking about the fact that you will be those that will be resurrected. I want you to think on that part of hope because after we talk about judgment then we can focus on the hope and I want you to look at those verses in Revelations 20 there is a mention of the saints in two places that I'm thinking of the first one it says blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. That's us. We will be priests in the kingdom. And the other mention in verse 4 says, I saw thrones, plural. Paul said this when he was mad at the Corinthians. He said, don't you know we are to judge the world? Who are we going to judge between angels? And the thought is that God has given us the wisdom and the blessing to be able to judge this world in some way, right? He could literally be judging people and say, hey, I call as a witness, uh, Patty, if you gave that person a gospel, what did they say? Uh, they said, I don't want to hear that. Okay, thank you, Patty. That's a witness. Right? Or they could bring up someone and say, hey, Chris, what do you think to happen to this person? They didn't believe in me. What do you think? And you're going to be purified. You're going to be right. You're going to say, Lord, they should be judged. They rejected your truth. They rejected your son. They spit on him. And that's a powerful thing. It is a sobering reminder that we're going to have a responsibility in the last days. But it's also a blessing and an honor. Right? What do they call judges? Your honor. It's an honor to be a judge. Amen? Amen.